Welcome to the new podcast, A Mick, A Mook, and A Mike, hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer Frank Pace with retired New York City firefighter and Vietnam vet Billy O'Connor. Today's guest, professional soccer player and Olympic medalist Lauren Sesselman. brother. Week. Tell, give, give the audience a little update about your week. A little update on my week. Well, it was a hell of a week. I'll, t- <laughs> I'll tell you that. I was in surgery on Wednesday. I had double hernia well, operator. What well, was it good enough for you? You had them too. Yeah, well, I, well, I've been carrying you and Derek around <laughs> for for almost 10 months now. So I had to do some heavy lifting. So pretty much the, the, ox, the ox had died, so we hired you. <laughs> yep. By the way, the third man in the booth. Hello, hello. The hello, third guys. man. Was that an Orson Welles film? The I, third man? I don't know. But Billy, really grab that mic and put it in front of you. Put that mouth right here. Like that. That, that, that's, that's, right? Not, that's not in front. This is in front. Yeah, so this is the front of me. So and I can turn around and show him the back of me. Yeah. That's better? That's perfect, Billy. I know you don't like to be told what to do, but um, sorry. No, we have no to do one's that told me I'm perfect in a long, long time, Derek, but I appreciate it. Oh, I didn't say you were perfect. I said that's perfect. So I, I got sliced and diced. Sliced and, and diced. diced. You should see my junk now. It's black and blue. <laughs> you got blue balls. <laughs> I, got, I do have blue balls, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I really want to see your junk, Frank. So if you mean. Is this going to stop you this week from sending out the dick pics? There'll be no dick pics this week. <laughs> no, there, there'll be no Anthony Wieners of my wiener, for we sure. Should, we should wipe the media, Frank. I know there's a lot of women out there waiting to see your dick pics. You yeah, know? little Frankie, is that what you call him? Mini, mini Frankie. <laughs> As opposed to massive Derek. So what is it? Does it feel like a big kick in the balls? Is that what it, it was? It feels like it was a knife fight. You know, oh, uh, before oh. before. Uh, you used to have to cut you open. So this this was the laparoscopic surgery. Say that again? A laparoscopic? Laparoscopic surgery. So they made three incisions, one above my belly button, and two one to the left and one to my to the right. Oh. And then they blow a lot of air into my intestines and they go in and they patch the hernia. And that, then it, you know, I, I shouldn't say this because I'm not out of surgery I'm not out of the doctor's protocols yet, but I think I may have gotten upsold on the second. <laughs> he said, "Oh, I, I think you may have a second hernia there." I said, "Well, I, I, I don't feel one. <laughs> I don't feel one." Well, we better do it just he in said, case. We better sir. do it. Oh, he said, I, I, "I'll check it out. I'll, I'll tell you when when I take a look at you in person because I had a I had a Zoom, I had a Zoom consultation with him where the first one was obvious. The first one looked like a." Fist, but uh, the second one, he said, "I think you got a second one there." You think you got up? So you know what? I, I, I tell you, I, I. And how am I, how am I going to know? You so, don't know. That's the problem. I mean, I, I tell you, I have a. Well, I call him a. It's my brother's father-in-law. My brother's is a doctor, psychiatrist, and a lawyer. All three, and so I call him a cock relation because I don't know what you call right. your your father-in-law of your brother. You know, I don't know what that is. So he's a cock relation. But anyway. I, when I met him for the first time, I said, you know, I don't want to demean your I said, but I heard that 50% of operations are unnecessary. And you know what he said to me, Frank? He looked at me dead in the eye and he said, 75%. He said, that's complete bullshit. Complete bullshit. It's much higher than that. He goes closer to 85, 90%. Yeah. And I was like flabbergasted. Now, here's a guy who was a doctor and a psychiatrist. He told me he became a doctor. Because he was so disgusted with the law. Everybody knows lawyers, you know, the old joke about when you got a hundred lawyers and quicks. You, know, like, you know, I mean, he said he was disgusted with the ethics of lawyers until he became a surgeon and he said they're worse. Now that scares the shit out of me. It should scare the shit. I, I was at a dentist's office yesterday and I had to switch dentists. I loved the dentist I had, but he didn't take my cut. Hey, let me let me stop you for a second. Uh, and just remind the audience, our guest today will be Lauren Sesselman, Olympic uh, bronze medalist from the 2012 Olympic Games, uh, playing soccer for uh, playing soccer for Team Canada. So Lauren will be our guest today. She'll come, be coming up in a little bit, a little bit further on in the show. But now continue with the dentist. Yeah, the reason I'm, I'm using the dentist story because it relates to what you happened to you when you had your hernia. 
and the dentist I went to was fine. Liked the guy, great, but he didn't take my coverage. And now I, I found out I need implants. I need a lot of work done. So I had to go to another dentist. I went to the other dentist. They took x-rays. You know, this is just the other day. And I sat at the top. The other dentist had told me that it has to be fixed. And she took the x-ray. She goes, yeah, but I think you need root canal. I said, well, root canal. She goes, yeah, but, you know, I, I can fix it. She goes, but it's going to hurt later on down the road. So, I mean, like you said, I don't know. So I put my faith in her, right? So I said, well, okay, do the root canal. You know, another 800 bucks out the window with the insurance and everything else. But I think at this juncture, like he told me, the surgeon had told me, Billy, I live in Julie Andrews' old beach house. <laughs> he says, in Laguna, right? He said, I have an elevator coming down to the beach. My mortgage payments are $30,000 a month. He said, I got a new Mercedes. I got my boat. If you come to me and say, do I need an operation? I'm going to say, no, you need two operations. Right. You need three operations. Well, that's, that's what this guy said. Yeah, this guy the said, <laughs> you needed two operations. So I said, well, he said, but it'll only be another 20 minutes. <laughs> I said, well, as long as you're in there, fine. What am I going to do? I, if if, if, if I'm, I'm going to be right that I don't need another hernia operation. Well, how can you argue with him? Of course not. You can't know a little bit about surgery. You of know? course. It's like. It's like. Like when I know a little bit about brain surgery. Yeah, yeah I'll take a shot at it. I yeah. know a little bit about it. You know what I mean? It's like a colonoscopy. You know, when you get a colonoscopy, I was out like like a light, and I wake up, and the and the doctor says, "Well, you really did good. I got a couple of polyps. I took a, took took out a couple of polyps." And he shows me a tape. He says, "See that there's that one I scooped out." And I said, "That one." I said, "How the hell do I know that that's my tape?" <laughs> That could be. He could be. A t well, where, where does it? Where does it's it say? Standard. Yeah. Where does it say Frank Pace on the inside of my? I, I, I told you about an operation. I had a buddy of mine that his that his thing didn't work anymore. Right? His Johnson wasn't working anymore. So he says, "I'm going to get one of those steel rods." You know, because they had. To, yeah, I'm serious. No, the guy got one of these steel rods inserted. You know, and he says, "You pump it up." You yeah. know. So I said, "Well, that would have been handy a few times when I was drunk. I would like to have that that little that little doohickey." But he says, yeah, you just pump. I'd even go through that. It's 72, 73 years old now. I would just say, all right, it don't work. Call it a day. I had a good run. You know, right. I'm, not, I'm not looking to put a steel rod in there. Yeah, no. but, he, but he says, but, so, so my friend tells me, yeah, John's getting it done. He saw this doctor on Fox. He's supposed to be the best in the country. I said, the guy was on Fox? He might not even be a doctor. <laughs> You're going to go to him? Why don't we get off this subject and get on to another subject? Uh, and, I, I have one more and, a trivia and, thing and, for you guys. And clean your corners while you're at it. Okay, a trivia thing. Yeah, do you guys know who the father of uh, of, of uh, the pharmaceutical industry is in America? The father of the pharmaceutical father, I didn't know there was the, a father. Of the, uh, no, you didn't. It's not George Washington. He's the father of the country. <laughs> not George Washington. In fact, it's very, very recent. Really? Within the last hundred years. Okay, so let me give you a hint. He's one of the richest people ever in the history of America. Why do I keep thinking you're going to go back to Gates? <laughs> Not, uh, well, Gates is related to him. Well, who is it? Rockefeller. Rockefeller's the father of the pharmaceutical. Now, is it true that most pharmaceuticals come out of the rainforest, out of Brazil? Uh, it is true. It, they don't come out of the rainforest. They basically took what were natural remedies in the past and tried to find a chemical equivalent. So, but the 90% of what, what, what we use for pharmaceuticals, we could have found in the rainforest. Yes. If you've got time to go foraging. <laughs> Pro probably the secret to the world health in the future lies still in the rainforest. I'm sure if 90% if of the cures they come out of there with, imagine how many are actually in there. Yeah. If they haven't found. Yeah. I mean, there's some old witch doctor, Bolivian forest, that knows more than the, <laughs> some guy. Like that guy, in, like that guy in Game, Game of Thrones. With, with the melted face, that, that old wise man. I, there is a problem with presentation, though. You know, it's like a, if a guy with a with a mask on, the voodoo thing, and he's telling me he's got the cure. I'm probably going to go to the guy with the white frock on Madison Avenue. You know? Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. But yeah, I think it's all tons of money involved. I mean, just a amount of money. Look at the Sackler family with this, uh, with, the, with the with the opiates. Yeah, those guys made. Billions, and now they're bankrupt. They say they're bankrupt, so they can't pay the fines. They got the money buried in Switzerland. They turned the whole country into opiate addicts. Yeah. With the oxycotton. I mean, everybody was doing oxycotton. They were prescribing it for toothaches, for God's sake. What does that feel like? Oxycodone? I, you know, I tried one I, once. I had. 
Did you? I had one pill. He get, the doctor gave me four pills. Did you snort it? <laughs> the doctor gave me four pills. I swallowed it whole. <laughs> you took four actually? No, no, no. I took I took one. Oh. I took I took one of the four. The other three are in the cabinet, and I'm not going to get any of them for you. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, because I, I, I'm better now. Remember how messed up I used to be? I'm much better. Didn't you now. tell me a story about morphine one day? <laughs> yes, my buddy Kenny. Was, we were at a job, and uh, I was still in the engine. I wasn't in the truck, so we were putting out the fire. The engine puts out the fire. They're the ones with the water. So Kenny had the nozzle, and we're going down this hallway. We go into the tenement. There's three rooms of fire. Kenny gets burnt. I'm behind him. I'm backing him up on the nozzle. Now I get my ears singed, but Kenny gets pretty decently burnt. So they send him to the burn unit after the job. They send him downtown. It's like 3 o'clock in the morning. So now it's 9 o'clock in the morning. I get off work. Well, I got to go see my buddy. I'm going to go see Kenny. See of course. What he's doing. So I buy a case of beer. <laughs> Throw a case of beer on my shoulder. Go down to the hospital. Flash my badge so I can go up to the room without visiting hours. And Kenny's sitting up in bed. I said, I'm glad you're better, partner. Let's have a couple of beers. Now it's 9 o'clock in the morning. We're having a couple of beers. Actually, I'm laughing. We're, we're exchanging stories. About 10 o'clock. The nurse comes in with a tray. She's got four little paper cups of morphine. She says to Kenny, do you feel like uh, you need some morphine? Pain okay? Kenny says, no, no, I don't, I don't take morphine. I said, <laughs> I just, I start giving them, I said, take the morphine. I said, you know what? Just leave the morphine here. I says, you'll take it later. She looks at me and she goes, how stupid do you think I am? She goes, I can hear you laughing. Four doors down. You already drank six cans of beer. Nine o'clock in the morning. You think I'm leaving you more? <laughs> I said, hey, that was worth a shot. But I said, but don't you ever refuse drugs? Ever. If you don't need them now, you can always use them later. I said, don't ever refuse drugs. Yeah. That's the way I was. Right now, I'm much better. You're much better. I, you can, every, our, our, our audience can tell. My body's a temple. Frank. Yeah, it's, it's a temple. temple. <laughs> well. Uh, why don't we just get Lauren? You want to get the why, hell why, out of this conversation? Why don't we get Lauren Sussman? Uh, bring Lauren in. Uh-huh. Can we do that, Derek? I, definitely a good idea. Definitely, fellas. We'll get Lauren in. We've got Lauren in. Lauren, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? We're doing fine. Hey, you guys have like the full setup and everything. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> this is my partner, Billy O'Connor, retired lieutenant Billy O'Connor, 9-11 first responder. And there's Derek Harris. Uh, over there on, on the big board. Off camera. Pleasure, What's up, guys? pleasure <laughs> to meet you, Lauren. Absolute pleasure. Before we even Thanks start, I, me. I know you're from Green Bay. Tell us what's going on with Aaron Rodgers. Come on. What's going on up there? Oh, gosh, you guys. Let me tell you. <laughs> I, I I don't know all the drama behind the scenes, but um, I could tell he probably wasn't very happy, especially with our draft pick um, last year. But um, I hope he stays. I mean, he's our franchise player. He's what makes this team kick, and it's going to be um, a travesty if he leaves. So he is Green Bay, and he can't leave. He can't do the Brett Favre. He can't do the Brett Favre. Hey, before we get into soccer and all your accomplishments since soccer, why don't you tell us about what football means to Green Bay? I mean, it's, oh yeah. I mean, was there sixty thousand people in Green Bay, and the stadium holds a hundred? Something, <laughs> something no, like that. We have, we, yes, that's what everyone thinks. Um, but we actually have around a hundred thousand. Um, I think people actually that live in Green Bay, um, which you would never know if you go there. But football is everything to that city. Um, so definitely, last year was kind of weird with COVID not having it. Um, but I mean, what's the most special is that everybody in the city owns a piece of the team, and I think no other team does that. And I think. Um, we are really the heart of football, and it's so special. If you have never been to a game, you guys, you have to go to Green Bay. Um, the cheese curds are amazing. The fans are awesome. Everyone is just so sweet. And the tailgate, let me tell you, you have the best tailgate in the NFL. So you guys have to come. <laughs> Didn't Vince Lombardi live within, uh, wasn't his house like walking distance from Lambeau Field? Um, I think so. I actually don't know that, but I. that's why, like, Right outside Lambeau Field, you'll see all the houses. They took all the houses there. People bought them up. They scooped them up, and they're making them into these big Air Airbnbs. They have like football go posts and go posts and all the um, yards, and they just made it like one big tailgate zone in all those houses. So it's like a nonstop party in Green Bay. So it's so much fun. Yeah. 
I, I was going to ask Lauren that about the fact that stockholders still being the people at Green Bay that own the team. That's remarkable. And, and you think it's because of the cold weather? You think like in Buffalo is the same thing. They're, they're nuts in Buffalo for their football too. Is it because of the cold weather, you think? Is that one of the reasons? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but yes, they are nuts in Buffalo, but I think we're we're more nuts than anybody. But <laughs> I think it's just I think it's just it's just a testament to the city itself and to the people, the good people that live there. And I think it's just it's the heart of everything that goes on in Green Bay. I mean, literally there's one street in Green Bay that has all the restaurants and it has Lambeau Field. Um so and then they have all the the breweries, of course. So so beer cheese and football, if you guys are looking for a good time. Definitely Lambo. Cheese and football. And the Packers were yeah. the Packers were named after Meat Packers. It, yep. The Green Bay Meat Packers. I think Labardi went to Fordham University. I think it was one of the seven yes. blocks of granite. He was Bronx guy. Seven. There you go. Back to the Bronx. Six degrees of separation. You bet. Yep. You bet. So Lauren, uh you were an all American at Purdue. One of the one of the greatest scorers in that school's history. You scored thirty four goals, had twenty two assists, chipped in for ninety ninety points. But I, one of the things that struck me is that you had 13 game-winning goals. That's an incredible figure. How, wow, how, I didn't even know that. <laughs> how? What was it about scoring when the game was on the line that meant so much to you, that took your game to another level? Because if you scored yeah. 34 goals, 13 of them game, game winners, you had to be at a different level to do that. I mean, I think it's just, kind of who I am as a person and a player like I love you know the whole you know everyone's looking at you to bring the team together to score that game winning goal and you know I've been working through those moments my whole entire life ever since I was a, a little girl you know I wanted to to play soccer I wanted to get a scholarship I wanted to play professionally and I worked so hard to get to that level and to have everybody behind you and believe in you and look up to you and, and say, we believe in you, Seth, you know, to, to go out and score those goals, I think um, it's something pretty cool and pretty special. And what's crazy is I turned into a center forward to a center back down the road, but um, so now I stop goals. But uh, gosh, Purdue was like the best time of my life. We had such a good time. We had such a good squad. I mean, the, the team was so good. We were top 10. We really brought, um, the Big Ten and Purdue, we put them on the map, and we just had such a great time. And it, it's it's so cool to see all the the younger generation coming up through the ranks, and you know, just just you know, making this program even bigger and even better. And I'm, I'm very proud to be a Boilermaker alumni. Well, I'll tell you, it's coincidentally, Derek's daughter is a senior at Northwestern on scholars soccer scholarship. Uh, oh, she's been at Northwestern going to graduate this year so they good school they had it truncated her senior year was a truncated senior year but uh and his, his son essen also played at boston university so we've got a wow. we've got a soccer family here uh for sure i uh, love it <laughs> i've been to purdue it's a pretty cool cool place very very pretty campus and a great area in the middle of nowhere it's it, in the middle of nowhere <laughs> totally totally in the middle of nowhere yeah i wouldn't change it for anything though how did you time. how did you you, Rob Claddy was your coach. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you? Where did where did he see you? Where did he? Where did so he start actually, tracking you? Um, a lot of people don't realize that nobody really wants to um, recruit within Wisconsin. I don't know what it is about Wisconsin, but a lot of college coaches don't want to recruit within Wisconsin. They don't think we have great players, which is completely false. And I had the opportunity to back in the day when ODP, the Olympic Development Program, was, was a big deal. Um, I had the opportunity to go um, and play. And Rob was actually one of the coaches there at camp. And I thought he was so funny. He was so smart. And he actually cared about players, you know, um, just like you, Frank. That's how I met you as well, so through soccer. And I, and I think it's so hard to find coaches that really really believe in you as a player um really want the best for you um and so when i saw that in him i was like wow like he's an amazing coach i would love to play for him if i got the opportunity someday and i did campus it was the coolest experience ever like i loved everything about purdue 
the history, the program, what Rob was talking about, the, the squad that he was creating, the squad that was already currently there. Um, to be able to play alongside of them was a dream come true and, and get a scholarship, you know, was obviously the number one thing on my, my bucket list was to get a scholarship and to play D1. So um, it was an amazing experience. Uh, before I get into, before I talk about soccer, uh, what I want to talk about this question. Uh, first of all, Isabel Harvey, my friend Isabel Harvey says hello to you. The, uh, Hi. the, the great Canadian scorer. Um, but it makes me think of a question is, did you ever play for a woman coach? And what differences did you find between men coaches and a woman coach? And mm -hmm. uh, I, I recommend that you know all college coaches should be females who coach female athletes. Uh, now, mm -hmm. that, that may not be true, but what did you feel uh, between male coaches and female coaches? Honestly, I've been very lucky with the coaches that I've I've had, and I really haven't had much of a difference between them. Um, I've enjoyed all the coaches that I've had, and, and not a lot of people can say that. I've been very fortunate. Actually, I didn't start soccer until I was 11, 12 years old, and my first coach was a female. And honestly, I loved her. She was amazing. She was just so upbeat and positive all the time, which was what I needed to see if I really loved the game. Um, and then I also had one when I first got into the league, um, Emma Hayes was my first coach at Chicago. That's where I got drafted. And then I went and, um, went to New Jersey where I had a female coach as well. And, you know, everyone wants to have these comparisons between them, but I think if you, if you care about the, the players, if you understand the game, if you know how to coach, um, then I think that there shouldn't be that many comparisons. And um, sometimes the women are like a little bit more understanding. Um, they they kind of know how emotional we are. Maybe they cater to that side a little bit. But I've also had male coaches that understand it. And they're always there. Like I would say like Robert Claudie, like Coach Claudie was, was, was one of them who was my favorite male coach where I knew that I could go in and talk to him at any time and talk to him about anything that was going on in my life. And I think that's really important as a coach. I, I've seen a lot of bad coaches, male and female. So I don't think it, it matters I, um, if you're male or female. I just think it's how you approach the players, how you make them feel um, wanted, how that you make them feel that they're good enough to be there. You know, I think the mental part of the game is the biggest part of the oh. game. And I think if you have a coach, that's helping you through that process, I think you're going to succeed. That's an interesting uh, quote there when you say that the mental part of the game is more important than the physical part of the game. Oh, yeah. 99% really? would be mental. Yeah, I mean, you could easily flip the switch like that, take yourself right out of it. And, um, and then I'm seeing that as I'm coaching a lot of the youngsters and stuff. I'm seeing how really important and imperative the mental side of the game was. And then in going through my own journey, like, that's what I would say. It's all mental. Interesting. Well, speaking of your coaches, I noticed that uh, this Gareth O'Sullivan, right? Obviously a Mick like myself, <laughs> Gareth O'Sullivan. He's the guy who converted forward to a defender. And let me full disclosure, I don't know that much about soccer. But, uh, I mean, I watch it. I appreciate it. But I don't watch the same game you watch or Frank watches or Derek. I just don't know that much about the game. So we're watching two different games. But did you have any resentment when they – transferred you from uh, converted you from being a scorer to a defender actually it wasn't gareth but he he i actually was playing forward and midfield for him when he when i was playing underneath him and then carly lloyd's coach um came in james galanis who was basically like i'm going to give you an opportunity to play and that's when my career kind of took off i i owe a lot to james i would say and he gave me the opportunity to play. I played up top. And then he did try me at training once at outside back, but I didn't know what I was doing. And um, But he's like, you could probably play there someday. And it wasn't really until I joined the national team. And um, and Coach Herdman is the one that really converted me from, you know, forward to outside back and then to center back. So I would say he's the one that really kind of like called really helped me find my own and kind of where I belonged. And 
it's crazy to think that you were a center forward and scoring so many goals and then you get to the pros and it's a completely different world. And in the pros, the first three years in it, I didn't play much at all. And I didn't kind of, I didn't know if I was ever going to play. And I almost gave up and until I got that call. Literally, I think the day before I got the call for the national team, I told my dad, and I, and I think I, I gave it all I got. Let's and then let's the let's, called. let's go back because uh, you were born in Green Bay. I was born in um, Stevens Point, but yeah, it's close to Green Bay. Stevens yeah. Point. How did you make your way onto the Canadian national team? So, um, so yeah, I grew up in Wisconsin, but my father is Canadian. He was born in Canada. He was born in um, Newfoundland. Um, so my grandparents lived there for a long time. And I would say Wisconsin is pretty much Canada. I mean, they're so close. And we would go, and we would go camping all the time. And I mean, I'm like a youper, a youper anyways. I'm like, yeah, A, you know, I'm saying A all the time anyway. So people are like, you for her. You would go to Canada all the time. You know, my parents, my mom grew up in Detroit too. She would always go up to Canada, but my dad grew up there. And so I got my, um, citizenship that way. I got a question about your citizenship. I, I was born in Ireland. And mm -hmm. Ireland's one of the few countries that allows you dual citizenship. I have an Irish passport and an American passport. Israel's another one. Does Canada allow you dual citizenship or do you have to? Yeah, you, you have to you have to get it in order to play on the national team. So I had to go through the citizenship process um, in order to do that. Did you My have to renounce your American citizenship or were you allowed to have both? No, I have both. Oh, that's cool. So you're allowed dual citizenship. Yeah. I didn't know that Canada yeah. did that. Now, I, mm -hmm. I want to take issue with something that you said. You got all these big name coaches that were seeing you, but uh, in 2005, when we met, you were on the U.S. The National Select Team camp in Minnesota, and uh, I so long ago, <laughs> long ago, 2005. Uh, I believe that I put you at defender. Did you? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, in, that is in the in the middle of the second game. I went to Alex. And I said, Alex Mihalovich, who was the head coach of the Region 2 select team, I said, you know, she's really good forward, but I really think she's a defender. So you played half of the second game and the third game on defense. I don't even, okay, I've had a lot of concussions. I don't really remember what happened <laughs> yesterday. But, okay, let me, let me retract and say I owe everything to Frank because <laughs> that's what he wanted to hear. Now you're in the ball game. Now you're in the ball game. That's exactly what he wanted to hear. So I, I just, I just want to say, I wasn't surprised when I saw you on defense for the kids. I think I was always like a very defensive minded forward. I always, when I lost the ball, I'd win it back. I always loved to slide tackle and I was good in the air. So, um, I'm kind of not surprised that I got moved back there and I'm not the fastest, but I'm smart. So this is what I tell the youngsters. It doesn't, you don't have to have every single quality. It just work on what you're good at. And if you know your strengths, there's so many different pieces. If you're not fast, just, just be smart, understand, read, be able to read players and, and always be a versatile player. I think that's really important to stress to these youngsters. And, be versatile. and defense is all about intensity and how hard you work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm crazy. I'm and, <laughs> and, and you have to be fearless. So yeah, uh, you know, Lauren was all three of those things, and, and I saw that on offense, and that's why I su suggested to Alex we put her back on defense. Uh, it was great. It was great. No, well, no, no. no. I'm the vitiate. I got to ask you a question. Three years to the soccer players. Do you think is it like pool? Do you think ahead? Is that what makes you a good? It's about smarts. I mean, you always think a couple of moves ahead, or is that what's going on out there? I mean, you kind of have to. Like, also, when I know when I get the ball, I know where I want to go. I yeah. see where the open player is. Um, it That's why I say most of it's, like, mental. It's always being one step ahead of everybody. And before each game, I always try to learn each player that I'm playing against so I know their tendencies. And, you know, you, you read the little cues. You know when someone puts their head down, they're going to go long, and that's when I can, you know, take my couple wow. steps back. And I Yeah, so um, – so does it, tells, there's actual tells. The oh, players for, have tells. For sure. Yeah. As, as a goalkeeper, the forward always has tells. You know, the, say which direction they're yeah. going to go. Uh, what, when, wow. when they're looking at with they're looking with their eyes to a corner, they're usually going to yeah. shoot to that corner. Yeah. Uh, so I, I say, you know, forwards aren't the brightest people in the world. <laughs> That's why I moved back to defense. That's why she moved know? back to defense. That's why she moved back to defense. So you came out of Purdue. Uh, and you went into the 
WPSL? Yeah, so the league had folded. Um, the WUSA, so that was New Hands League, um, and that's the league I wanted to play in. But then it folded, and I was kind of like, ooh, what's next? Is there going to be another professional league that comes back around, or what am I going to do? And I actually went, you know, played um, – I stayed at uh, Purdue and um, there was a team there that I played with FC Indiana. Um, and then I also worked for IBM for about a year and a half. Um, and so my dad did not want me to leave that job when I wanted to go play soccer, but I said, dad, you know, let me be around you instead of making money. Um, so shout out to Ernie. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, so did for about a year and a half. And then the league came back in, in 2009, I went to a combine and then I got drafted. Yeah, and then you played uh, for Atlanta, Sky Blue Kansas City, Sky Blue FC, Atlanta FC, Kansas City, Houston Dash. What those years like for you? Because I I don't think you made twenty four thousand dollars a year, did you? I mean, let me tell you. Pro, let me tell pro, you. Pro soccer is, is no breeze for a, a female game. So my first year getting drafted, um, I didn't have you don't have a set contract right away. You have to go in and earn it. And I got traded to Jersey Sky Blue, which I became just a developmental player. Nobody kind of knew who I was or what I brought to the table because I didn't really get much of an opportunity. Um, so at that time, I was only making seven hundred dollars a month, wow. um, which is and this is <laughs> so a pro. Bad. This is a, as a pro, seven hundred yeah. a month. Yeah, we were living in a hotel. It was like an extended stay, but the whole team lived there, and we actually won the championship that year. So. As much as it, it was so hard to not make any money, it was one of the best seasons ever. We had so much fun. Um, and then I went to Atlanta, and I was still making about the same, $1,000 a month, you know, without taxes and stuff like and that. You, and you, then, were, you were making appearances also as part of that $1,000 or supplemental appearances? Did you make money? Over? It, it varied on teams. Sometimes you didn't get paid for appearances. You would just get gas money, but the men were getting paid and you'd be like doing an appearance alongside them. And they're getting paid for the appearance and then you're not, it didn't make any sense to me. Um, I was working multiple jobs just to kind of make ends meet. And that's, that was part of the reason why I was like, do I want to do this or not? But I, I had a lot of goals and I kind of wanted just to see it through to see if I could do it um, before I kind of gave up. And that's why it's really hard for a lot of these players nowadays that you see a lot of them retiring earlier because, but the, I will say the money situation is a lot better than when it was when I was coming up. It wasn't until I joined Canada is when I started actually making a little bit of money. But let me tell you, it was not a lot. It was, I will say it on here because I think it's really important for people to know. I was playing for two teams. So I was with Canada and I was with, um, I was with Kansas City. So that, that was when the NWSL came. So two teams, one salary because our federation was paying for it, 30K. For two teams. For two teams. Thirty K. That is nothing. And I mean when taxes were taken out. So and it was really hard because coaches like, we don't want you to have extra jobs. But I'm like, what do you want me to do? You're making tons of money as a coach. Coaches were getting paid so much money, but we weren't making anything. And I wouldn't sh and I am saying this, I wouldn't change it for the world. I, I love the daily grind. It made me who I am now today. And it was so much fun. I had the best time. Just to say that I was a pro is the coolest experience ever. But it didn't really leave you much for retirement. Um, as I say, even though I was a starter, I was a starter on both teams, um, won two medals. Still, my salary was the same. We got a lot of things. We were in FIFA, but they took away those rights as well. So we didn't make any money. But college players were making money. It was just there's just so much that goes on that people don't understand. So when the whole fight for equality came out and everyone was talking about it, the amount of hate messages and the things that people were saying that they, they absolutely had no idea, no idea what it was like or what was really truly going about behind the scenes. And so that's why I'm now such an advocate in fighting for, um, you know, equal pay, but everyone thinks equal pay means the exact same amount of money that they're making. That's not what we're saying. We're just saying better conditions, better pay, better everything. So that's what we're we're working on. Um, I and I'm, Two daughters. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with you. you know, if you're going to do the job, yeah. you should get the same pay. And, uh, I know. And the thing was, we were having we had a lot of fans. We had a lot of fans. People were coming. So people have that misconception as well. I mean, we were selling out for Canada. We were selling out more so than the Mets. People were buying wow. their jerseys. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you guys had a legitimate shot at winning a yeah. championship. I mean, you played 46 games team. You played in the Pan Am Games, won a gold medal. You played in the Olympic Games. You won a, a 
a bronze medal. Uh, mm -hmm. You played in the World Cup. Uh, had a, a, a terrific career. But let's go back to 2011. What was it like, and how were you notified that you made the Canadian team? And what did it feel like when you stepped on the field uh, for the first time in the Pan Am Games? So it was crazy. As I said earlier on, I almost, I almost quit. I almost kind of hung up the cleats. I was like, Dad, I've been playing for three years, and nothing's really happening. No one's giving me an opportunity. You'll, you'll notice sports are very political. Um, and so I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to get a shot. You know, I did it. And I had been a couple years prior to that. I had been reaching out to the, the national team and was like, Hey, this is me. This is where I'm going to be playing. I hope you guys maybe give me a, a chance to come into camp. Just kind of watch me play, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I kept, you know, stayed on top of them. And then 2011 came and they didn't do the best in the world cup that year. And they had coaching changes. Um, and that's when John Herdman came in and he was kind of like, look, I'm going to change this program around. And that's exactly a lot of fresh new faces, gave people a lot of opportunities. Um, and I owe so much to him. You know, when I got that that email, I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, like I went crazy. I like called my dad right away. And I was like, so excited now. So I had the opportunity. Now I had to capitalize on it. So I go into camp. Shaking in my boots, you're standing next to Christine Sinclair, who you've like looked up to your whole entire life, who's and you're just like, whoa. Who was a great, know? who was a who was a great American player for the University of Portland? Christine yeah, Sinclair. I mean, she's she's all around the most amazing person ever. But just being in that atmosphere is like, so you're playing, you played college, then you played pro, and it's like a whole nother level. Then you're at the national level, international level, where it's like a whole new ball game where everyone is in. And you're like, wow, I'm actually here. Pinch me. And my first day, I'll never forget. John comes up to me. We're doing some like forward drills, and he's like, you know, you're left footed. You need a left back. Um, I'm gonna put you there. And I was like, excuse me. Um, I still like had tried it once in practice, but I didn't understand the position. No one taught me the position. I didn't know. I, it's not what I expected. So he throws me in there, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna like just just play the game. You know the game. Just just do whatever you think comes naturally. And it's a really hard position if you don't know how to play it, when to step, when not. You can really, like, screw over the back line if you don't know how to play it. I remember just taking a shot from, like, almost midfield, and it went upper 90, and he was like – and I was like, whoa, that just went in? I was like, cool. So then he pulls me aside, and he's like, three – so he pulls me aside, he's like, you're going to start there. We play USA in three days, you're going to start. I was like – um okay i don't know if i'm quite ready for that yet but like so those those days leading up to it he prepared me i worked on it i learned from the other defenders and he just made you really believe and he's like just go out there and play you know how to play and i remember going up against heather o'reilly shout out to heyo um one of the fastest u.s players ever to play the game i think and um yeah i think we ended up we played them two for two games that week and I think we tied and I think we tied both games zero zero and one one or something like that, and it was the most surreal experience. I mean, to play against the U.S. players who you've also looked up to your whole entire career was 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 pretty. I had to mark Abby Wambach, and I was like looking up, like, oh my gosh, how am I going to mark her? She's insane. But um, it was it was so surreal. And then my career just kind of took off. We went to the Pan American Games and we won a gold medal. And John just really flipped flip the switch and now we were on the map and we couldn't let up and then we went into an Olympic year and we we, we crushed it. We should have been in the the final <coughs> but we won't get into that. Yeah, that, 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 <laughs> that was a controversial game. You lost four three the ref, to, you lost four the three ref is no You lost four three to the US, correct? The ref is never allowed to ref again. She had to go to court Really? Because she nice. Yeah, she gave them she gave them a play that is not really a thing even pia after the game was like canada should have won everyone but it's right now that that game alone was the most watched sporting event in men and women's across all sports like that semifinals, they keep replaying it because it was it was so pivotal and that's how we all got in the hall of fame as well because of that year so especially yeah remarkable i, I, I gotta just ask a question for clarification when you were telling the story 
as a the physio, they get, what does upper 90 mean? Is that upper 90? Is that mean part of the net or what does that mean? Yeah, so like like if this is the goal, it's like in the little corner. It had something the to do with the position. When you said upper 90, I was like, uh, I was it's lost. It's very hard for keepers to, to get there. To it's get like, it's a sweet spot. Sweet spot, I got yeah. you. That, that, that game must have ramped up even more the emotional feeling between the two teams, the U.S. and Canada. When, oh, yeah. When did you next meet the U.S.? As, um, was it the World Cup? Or I, I, I don't. We didn't play them in the World Cup. We, um, we lost to England in the World Cup. When, when yeah, let's not talk about that game. <laughs> <laughs> let's not talk about that uh, situation. I don't remember, but we played them in a couple friendlies. Um, and then obviously we went into the NWSL where we were like teammates with all of them. So I was teammates with Becky Sarban and Lauren Chaney, the two most amazing players ever. Like I learned so much from Becky. Like she's really, because in the Olympics, because all of our summer backs got hurt. So in the third game, um, I moved there and that's a whole nother position as well. So after that, I got to really learn from Becky Sarban, which she's incredible. And then Lauren Chaney, seriously, I mean. What can you say about her? She's like one of the best players I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> That's true. And you, and you played basketball as well when you were in high school, right? You played basketball. Your team went undefeated, won a national championship in Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. And so did you, did you uh, have basketball? A, yeah. Did you have a hard time deciding whether it was going to be basketball or soccer? Or does soccer was just, just a love? Just no. I, I did. Actually, basketball was my first love. I picked up the ball when I was like four because my dad was a huge basketball player. He was my coach to um, growing up. And I originally wanted to play in the WNBA. I think I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a basketball player. Um, and I was going to play both in college. And then my dad was I was talking to my dad about a lot. And he's like, if you really want to go pro in one of them, you have to choose just because it's so much work. And I fell in love. Obviously, I started playing soccer a little bit later, and I really fell in love with it. And I think there was just more opportunity there. And um, but basketball, I actually owe my defensive skills to basketball. If you ever watch me play, I I shield and I do a lot of things when I'm playing defense, like a basketball player. So that's why when I talk to kids, I'm always like, look, I think it's really important to be multi-sport athletes because you can take little things from each sport that you play, and it's. I don't know. I'm just a huge advocate really turned me into the soccer player that I am today. Lauren, don't you think also that being a multi-sport player helped your soccer ability? Because it used to be when when we were growing up, you played football, baseball, mm -hmm. basketball. We played all sports. Now in the area of specialization, you know, maybe athletes are a little bit better sports-specific athletes, but they're not as good mm -hmm. athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. and that comes from playing multi-sports I think everyone nowadays just wants you to focus on, on one sport one sport it's like ingrained in them and then I think people get burned out I think you need to let kids be kids and yeah. I think you need to let them do whatever they want and whatever makes them happy playing three sports makes them happy let them do it because I don't think parents realize they just want them to focus on want you to be an NFL player because they make the most money or NBA player but you need to let them decide what they want to do but also I don't think parents realize that that the amount of skills that they can pick up from each sport that they play. Like I, I've a lot of the girls that I've coached that were multi-sport athletes. I've seen become. Um, so I think it's really important. And one of the things I want to say to Lauren's credit, she was also an academic all Big Ten. She understood the importance of academics, and most people don't understand how important academics are to your soccer ability because soccer can help you get into a school you might normally not get into but mm -hmm. academics can help you get into any school and yep. and also uh, when it comes to financial you know you there's a lot more academic money available than there is athletic money and if you oh, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I mean, more sweeping people. Right? Yeah. So if, if you can earn academic money, that's that's that much money the coach has got to give you, and that mm -hmm. makes you attractive also. So do uh, they have a cap? Is there a cap for college coaches? How much money they can give out? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I believe uh, uh, on a, a college team can give out. Let, let's say 
12 full scholarships, the equivalent of 12 full scholarships. And that's got to go over a roster of 24 to 28 people. Mm. So, yeah. Title nine. Yep. And, and the men only get 9.9. .9. Uh, that's part of the reasons that they b balance it. Soccer. Nope. For a second, you mentioned earlier that, uh, that nowadays women's soccer, they get paid more, obviously, you know, it's, I don't know if it's exponentially more, but certainly it's more. You think a lot has to do with that because of the World Cup and the USA success in the World Cup of women's soccer and your own success? You think that contributed to the salaries going up? You know, I think it's I, obviously, yes, because of them, you know, being so successful, it's really kind of put soccer on the map and people are kind of looking at the U.S. And then now now you see around the world, you know, soccer getting bigger on the female side. It's always been more Europeans and other countries where the men's side was always so strong. And now you see the U.S., you know, just really crushing it and being really successful. And I think that's definitely then it's more eyes, you know, lots of more eyes are right. watching the game. And I think that's why, obviously, that translates to more money more and money. being able, yeah, more sponsorships available. I mean, they, the, I will give a lot of credit to the U.S. players. They have done a lot. I mean, bringing a lot of sponsors on board. We're getting like Secret, you know, Gatorade, Hulu, a, like a bunch of women's brands too. Like, I mean, just like Secret coming on board and supporting the league and before we didn't really have a lot of sponsors supporting the league because they didn't think it was going to be successful or they didn't want to invest money because they didn't know what was really going to happen but seeing the success of you know canada and other countries right. and us and stuff now people want to invest in it they want to invest in these players and a lot more sponsors now are saying hey we'll sponsor the league if you are giving some of this money back to the, the players so we are seeing that a lot more, which I think is is pretty special, and I kind of wish it was around when I was playing. <laughs> um, but yeah, more eyes. So what do you, what would you say a, a, an average player is making today? Sixty thousand. I mean it. No, 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 no. It's still really low. I think the average is twenty. I mean the minimum is twenty five thousand. Yeah. So when I first started, it was. 10,000, I think, but I was, they, before we had developmental players in my first year, so it was even less. Um, now they've changed it in this, in the NWSL. And so when we first started, I think the minimum was 10 or 15,000. Um, and then it was 20,000, 25, 30. And since if you were a national team player, you get 30, unless you were like a big, big name player, like an Alex or uh, closely more so for them. The U.S. players got a little bit more, but then also sponsorships was a was a big deal for the players. So that's why they would be making more money would be based on sponsorships. But not all not everybody gets sponsorships. And I think that's really important. It's only like the select few that are on the national team and not even everybody on the national team gets them. And so it's just the same people you see. So I really want to see that change, too, because there's so much talent in this league. And I feel like a lot of these girls are very deserving of sponsorships. So I hope that changes as well. And it's not the same people all the time. <laughs> so Lauren, you've had a fabulous playing career. What have you been doing since then? So I think that like, um, you know, being this high level athlete to what's next in life is, is it's hard. Um, you see a lot of athletes struggling with mental health and just kind of their identity. And I struggled with that. I really did. And that's why I'm a huge mental health advocate. I'm having a lot of conversations with people and I'm working with in the mental health space a lot, which I'm very passionate about. I'm also mentoring a lot of the youth players, up and coming players, especially more so on the female side. So we started a company called Yule Train Sports. Um, you can check it out on yuletrainsports.com. How, how do you spell Yule Train? Um, U-L-T-R-A-I-N sports.com, Yule Train. Okay. Yeah, and so the 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 essence of it is, I just felt like when I to talk to like a mentor that kind of helped me through the process. My parents had no idea how to help me get a scholarship, how to do this. You know, not a lot of people in Wisconsin went on to go play. We have Leslie Osborne, and shout out to Leslie, who I always wanted to kind of emulate and Jada Merritt, but we didn't have a lot of players. And so no one really knew the steps in it. Luckily it all kind of figured itself out, but I think that my career could have been a little bit different if I would have kind of known. So I think having, being able to mentor these youth, we, we, we have the kids, either individual players or teams connect with their idols. So they can, let's say they want to connect with a national player, Manchester city. We have men and women 
um, they get to sit and they get to talk to their role models and ask them questions. And I think it's really special to be able to have that that personal contact with somebody that's been there and done it. And it just kind of puts a little pep in your step. And um, so that's been very rewarding to help these kids kind of help them with their career. Like I, I took a group of kids and we wrote college letters because um, I always say be very proactive when you're when you're speaking about yourself and talking to colleges and what you want to see and what you want to get if you want to get a scholarship or whatever. So we, we did um, we formulated some letters to send to colleges and I helped them with those. So that's very special. I'm doing a lot of TV work. I love, I'm very passionate about talking about sports, um, especially soccer. So been doing that, you know, a lot of fitness and we're going to start now that things are opening back up, doing camps around the world. Um, I've been very fortunate with my career and I want to give back more and go to countries that maybe don't get to have, you know, professional players come in and, and hang out with them. So um, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at right now. So working on some little things here and there. So we'll see what happens. I think it's been a, it's been a very interesting process trying to figure out where I fit in and the things that really speaks to me and my purpose and my why. And I'm, I'm finally COVID kind of actually helped facilitate that a little bit more. So now I feel like I'm really coming into my own as, you know, as Lauren Susselman outside of soccer, which I think is really important for athletes. That's great. I know Derek has a question. Want to ask you about fitness? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted I wanted to know what the difference between fitness levels going from high school to college and then from college yeah. to and then from pro to even the higher level playing in the Olympics and, and such. I mean, each level is just it's a I think a lot of people don't realize that as how to prepare. And that's what we're seeing a lot when we're talking to um, the youth right now. I don't think. I think that's what needs to change, especially in the U.S., of how they're approaching working with athletes and what's important to have all the elements together. It's not just the technical ability. You see a lot of people just technical, technical, technical. But what about the tactical brain? What about the fitness part of it? The lifting, the mental part of it? There's so many components that go into being the ultimate athlete. And if that's what you aspire to be, you have to put all those pieces together. And so the fitness levels are completely different. When you get into college, I mean, you're starting off right away doing like crazy fitness testing. And if you don't come and fit, I'm sorry, you can lose your scholarship. So it's really important to do that. And then you've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of people who've gotten drafted um, and they maybe came from a big school. And I don't think they were really fully prepared of what it was going to be like at the pro level. And it's a completely different level. Like, and as I said, they will not sign you. You will not get, you know, you will not get your contract if you are not fit. I think fitness is is such a huge component um, of it. I mean, the fat, the pace of the game is just a completely different level at each of those stages. Um, so if you can't keep up, you won't be there. And there's someone that's waiting to take your spot. So um, I think if who's ever listening and, you know, you want to go on and you play, I think you have to make sure you have all those pieces. And and just wa by watching soccer so much, you can see the speed of play is so different. It's one, two, one, two touch, you know, people aren't holding on to the ball too long. And which I think in college, we hold on the ball a little bit more. We can do a little bit more. We're trying to be fancy, do all these things. When you get to that next level, someone's going to come and smash you. Right. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, the pace of the game is, is you the had biggest a, You had a two year athlete. layoff in the pros, right? Before you went to the Santa Clarita uh, Blue Heat. How did you overcome uh, that? That must have been awful for a two-year layoff. How do you overcome something like that? So when I retired from pro, and then I actually moved out to L.A., and for, I'm playing for Blue Heat right now, and I just came out here and I was like, oh, I want to play. It's semi-pro, but the, the level, we have a lot of Stanford, USC, UCLA players. So we have, like, the top college players on our team, and so the level of play is pretty spectacular, and I see – I'm a sports agent now too, so I see a lot of this young talent, and I'm like, "Ooh, I want her when she's <laughs> done with college," you know. So it's it's pretty cool to see that how the game has changed and evolved so much from when I was playing. And um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, soccer is something that makes me happy. And you know, when I retired, I wasn't fully prepared to be done with soccer. And then you're done, and you're like, "Oh my gosh," you know, I feel a little unhappy you know my mental health maybe is, is not where it should be and um 
And so now getting back into it and just playing for fun, I think has been really refreshing. We have our first game tonight, actually. So I'm pretty excited for that. Just go smash some girls. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fun for me. It's like, a, it's like my relief just to go out and play. Um, I'd rather go play sports all day than go to the gym and stay there for like 10 hours. So um, it's definitely my relief. Lauren, I, I have another uh, question uh, going back to fitness because I want this to be helpful for you know, a girl that's in high school going to college and that doesn't have the help of, of uh, someone from the outside. So if you're trying to get to that level as a high school player, what kind of, where could you get some fitness goals from uh, that would make somebody come into uh, college fit, you know, without a coach helping you, without, uh, I know the college coaches will send you a packet, but sometimes mm -hmm. even that's not appropriate. I mean, to be honest, like I would, when I got my packet, I didn't know either. So yeah. I, I feel this, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I just knew what I felt like when I was playing in the game and how much endurance you needed to have. So I did a lot of plyo agility work. Um, I was running sprints. I was, I found a, a random hill running hill sprints, um, going out for longer jogs to really get that endurance. Um, yeah, you do get the packet and I did follow it you know, as much as I could, but I also went out and I think playing the game is probably one of the best fitness you can do is like going and playing pickup, just getting out there playing is the biggest thing. Cause you're going to, that's how you're going to get game fit. You can go run all day and then you get into a game and you're huffing and puffing. And you're like, Oh, you know? So I think just like getting out there and playing a lot, but what's amazing about social media, the positive side of social media is that there are a lot of um, people you can follow that will show you a lot of, tips and tricks and things to get prepared. You can reach out. People are more accessible. I'm very accessible on there. So if there is, you know, a, a young one listening, you can always reach out to me and say, Hey, you know, what kind of stuff do I need to do? Um, that's the positive side of social media and, you know, and having a mentor and, and things like that. But I think the best thing is really just going out and playing as much as possible or just taking a ball. Like I'd grab my brother's. Um, and I would shoot on them, would run around yourself with good people who are going to be positive influences and uplift you and w want similar goals, um, I think is really important as well. Well, I always tell my players that it's not the work that you do in practice that counts, it's the work that you do after practice. Exactly. And if you, if you know you're, you're weak with your left foot, you have to go out and take 100 shots with your left foot after practice. If you know you're weak with yep. your right foot, you have to go out and take 100 shots with your right foot after practice. If you know you're not strong in the air you have to work on in the air mm -hmm. and i always tell mm -hmm. my players that are going to college for the first time you have to be in the top three of your fitness test right off the yep. top and if you're not in the top three uh, and you think you're working hard you're not going to do it because no one can do it for you it's got to yep. come it's got to come from deep within you that urge that desire to be great and you yep. you, you always had it lauren and you mm -hmm. still always have it and I can't wait to see what you do in the future. Oh, you're so sweet. I thank you. Well, I, I, I always I, said I he was sweet too, Lauren. I always <laughs> said he was sweet. <laughs> Derek, Derek is the boss. He's the boss. Yeah, see, see that, Derek? Yeah, no, see I how don't, sweet no, he is, I don't, I don't see, see it. See no, how sweet he is? See that, Derek? Lauren says he's sweet. He must be sweet. I don't see it. No. <laughs> How do you guys have any I want to come hang out with you guys <laughs> on this amazing set. Yeah, you, you, it won't be so amazing if you see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any final closing comments for Lauren or questions, Derek? I, I have another question. You mentioned social media. I, I just wanted to know if, has it helped you at all? Not, not in, in terms of, uh, well, I, I'll just say this. Has it helped you be able to connect with, with uh, the soccer community? Yeah, I think social media is a double-edged sword. It can be a very bad place where people have want to <laughs> hurt you and bully you. But I think that there's also the positive side of it where um, it's allowed people to kind of be more vulnerable and open and personable, especially during the COVID time. I was connecting with a lot more people that I never thought I'd be able to connect with other athletes around the world. And we did a lot of Instagram lives and it allowed fans to kind of connect with us more and just see that we are human. And we do feel and think the same way that they do. And I've connected with a lot of people in my profession, um, in the soccer community, 
um, especially like going through a lot of the things during COVID, we, we all really came together. And then you see a lot of like the females, you see the WNBA, you see, you know, soccer, you see hockey, you see a lot of them coming together and, you know, being friends with each other to really kind of uplift female and women's sports. And I think that's been a huge positive and huge plus. You see it all over. Um, but also I think it's just been such a huge positive for, for fans and for, for youngsters to be able to reach out to us, to talk to us and to learn more about us and just to show them that, Hey, we are human and that they can achieve these things if they want them. And nowadays too, college coaches, and I'll, I will say this, um, college coaches, agents, et cetera, are looking to your social media um, to really um, connect with players as well and to really recruit. Um, so make sure your social media is positive. It's in, you don't have anything bad on there. You're just showcasing your talents um, because it is a tool that people are using nowadays yep. to recruit. So um, it's important to stress that. That's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, have well, it just seems to me that, again, as a complete diligence, you know, as an admirer of watching people on the field and seeing what it's all about, it seems to me that soccer is like anything else that's worthwhile. It's about sacrifice, hard work, and discipline. And if you're going to succeed, that's what you need. And that, that pretty yep. much sums it up, right? Sacrifice, yeah, I mean, hard it, work, discipline. Yep. And commitment. It's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. But I can tell you if it's something you want to do, it's it's 100% worth it. But it's a lot of work. People just think it's one practice a day, but it's not. It's what goes in is what Frank said behind and outside of, of training, learning, watching players, watching game film. I mean, I, I tried to see different players I wanted to emulate when I was learning outside back. It's the mental part of the game. You know, even the fitness testing, that's 100% mental, taking yourself in and out of that um, work on that. I think that's the biggest part of the game. And watch, um, the, watch the game. Watch the game. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The NWSL, I mean, it's been so fun to watch this year. Um, you know, I'm watching, I'm watching Premier League all the time. I'm watching MLS. I just love watching soccer. So I've been watching everybody and, um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful game. It's a beautiful sport. And I'm excited to see it just keep getting bigger and bigger, especially yes. on the women's side. And also I want to mention that, uh, our, our coach in Minnesota at the 2005 select team was Alec Mihaljevic. His son, Georgie is a starting center midfielder for the Montreal impact. Mm -hmm. And a member of the U.S. national team, so I thought. You oh wait, I oh I watched Montreal like I watched them all the time. I had no idea. Yeah, he's that's George. He was he was six. Who was six when when we were in Minnesota? He, he's grown up that's to be. Amazing. He's grown up to be. It a really is the ultimate team game, though, isn't it? I mean, it's totally. You can't do anything without your teammates. I mean, it's, that in football, I would yep. say American football, total team game. Lauren, who who's the uh, who's the best female player? Right? Right now, or, you, or, 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 or that's you we can do both. Okay. I think that's a really, really hard question to answer because I think that so many players are different in different ways. And I, you can't say one person is better than the other because maybe this person has a quality that this person doesn't have. Um, but I will say there's, I think women's soccer is pretty equal across the board. I think there's just so much talent in this game. Okay. Who's your favorite? So I think it's <laughs> who's your my favorite. favorite? Oh, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> I love watching, um, the French team play so much. The French I, by far, I think are the most talented players. Um, so less than Norris, she's coming to, um, Olympic rain. I mean, she's coming to all rain this year. So she'll be playing in the, in the NWSL, which I think is going to be really cool to see here. Um, but oh gosh, who else is really ask me who my ask me who my favorite is? I mean, you're just going to say me, but no, I'm just kidding. Hey, who's uh, who's your favorite? Lauren Sesselman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Uh, so this will yeah uh, this will air this will air on Wednesday. Uh, so if you want to post to your 120 thousand. Twitter followers that you're going to be on Wednesday. Uh, you can, okay. you can watch it on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, 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 we, we won't get into a Mick and Mook and a Mike.com. Uh, but <laughs> just, uh, that's a mouthful, <laughs> but they can watch it on Twitter also. So, uh, okay. it'll be a great day. It, it was so much fun having you. Oh, it was a pleasure. Pleasure meeting you. Yeah. Really pleasure. meeting you. And, uh, thanks for educating me. 
my small mind with a little bit about soccer, right? especially the upper oh 90. I like that. Yeah, upper 90. Yes. <laughs> the upper Any 90. Any day, anytime. You guys need me. But uh, thank you guys for having me so much. And hopefully, you know, maybe I can come be a co-host one day. I think you we wanna, could add a little sus, fine. flex flavor in there. You want to do it? You can be a co-host. We'll yeah, do definitely, it. for sure. That's, for sure. That's a definite. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Thank you, guys. Th thanks so much, Lauren. Thank you so much, Lauren. Pleasure meeting you. Bye. See, for, for a novice, he did pretty good. Oh, look, she kept saying Frank was sweet. And yeah, but everything else she said seemed to be on the money. I don't know. <laughs> She was accurate about 99%. The upper yeah. 90, she had accurate. Who the is, other part, this part about you being sweet uh, yeah. and inspirational. Uh, who is this guy that they keep talking about? I don't about? know. I'm trying to figure that out it's myself. Unbelievable. This sweet it's guy. It's like a completely and different person. My favorite guy, and I get a lot of that. And I want to thank him for all he's done. I have a theory. You have a theory? What's your theory? <laughs> it's a, it's, I think it's a, it must be a stature thing. You know, like It's, it's a status. What thing? It's a status uh, thing. Expand Billy. on that. Expand it's, on that. It's like if Billy lived in Beverly Hills, I think he'd probably get a little nicer treatment. You think so? Oh, yeah. Billy gets the nicest treatment I've got. <laughs> <laughs> because I respect everything that Billy stands uh, for, everything Billy has done. I respect the work that he's done as a fireman. I respect his career. What a guy. Uh, you see that? I, res no I, I respect it. Wait, wait, let me finish. I respect that he went back to school at 58. I respect that he graduated in '62. He is, he is the utmost status in my book. What a, what a nice thing to say. You know, he is a sweet man. You know, you see Derek and you, Derek. You've got the nicest wife and two kids. I've ever had. <laughs> despite their bad, despite your wife's bad eyesight, apparently. But yes. Uh, <laughs> hey, so uh, this week, who's the Fredo? Oh, we got a Fredo coming up. I'm smart. I'm not dumb like everybody says. I want respect, Frank. I want respect. I'm smart. <laughs> I'm not dumb. I'm smart. And I want respect. I'm your older brother, Mikey, and I'm just stepped over. I'm smart. <laughs> Who's the Fredo amongst the Bush family? The Bush family. Yes. We got George Sr. I know them all. Oh, the, the Jebs. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, and I think that amongst the Brooks family, uh, you have Prescott Bush, who was the founder. You have George Sr., who was the president. You had George Jr., who was the president. You had Jeb. And then you've got George, uh, Jeb's oldest son, George P. Bush, who's uh, going to be the fourth generation of books, Bushes in politics. Who do you think? I, I know mine. I know who I thought was going to be the Fredo before the 2016 election, but well, who do you think the Fredo well, was? Well, I, I guess you have to go with, uh, for the Fredo, I would have to go with Jeb, I think, because Jeb uh, was, uh, they had high hopes for Jeb, and of course, they didn't materialize quite as much. But Prescott Bush, you read the history of that guy. I mean, FDR, you know, Confiscated his money. He was doing big time banking with the Nazis. You know, Prescott Bush was was was, uh, was involved heavily with the Nazis uh, and cleaning money for them. So uh, I guess he'd be like the Don. He'd be the, he'd be the Don. <laughs> he'd be the Don. And it, and it, and it went downhill from there. Yeah. But I mean, you know, there's only been two families that have had two presidents: the Adams family and the uh, Bush family. Well, look at how far we fell. I mean, John Adams, you know, uh, and uh, Quincy. John Quincy Adams. I read about John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams at five years old, at five years old, was doing uh, complex math, you know, and he wanted to read the history of the Peloponnesian Wars, you know, but Thucydides', Thucydides history of the Peloponnesian Wars, and his father wouldn't let him read it at five because he said he wanted him to learn Greek first. <laughs> so he read it at seven in its original Greek. I mean, that's a hell of a <laughs> John Adams and John Quincy Adams, who might have been our smartest president, by the way, John Quincy Adams. No, President Bo President Trump was our smartest president. <laughs> you just ask him. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> Nobody can do this better than me. No, I'm the only guy who can fix it. <laughs> me, I'm the only guy. Which gets me now to this uh the big lie going on here. Uh, this thing has uh, gotten out of hand. When uh, you've got a, a congressman from Georgia saying, uh, 
you know, just a bunch of tourists. Meanwhile, you show pictures of the guy barricading the doors. I, I think they have to perpetuate this to justify voter suppression. I think that's pretty much what it's all about. I think so. I think so. It's, it's all about, you know, they got to they got to stay down this road. It doesn't matter what they do. So, who do you think is the Fredo in the Bush family? Oh, I always thought that it was George H.W. The old man, Herbert Walker. No, uh, George W. Shrub. Yeah, Shrub. <laughs> I always thought it was. <laughs> I, I always thought Little it was. Bush. I, always, shrub. I, I always thought it was Shrub because, you know, he was, you know, sort of a puppet of Cheney's. Um, yeah, he definitely gave and, him a and, lot of power. And, uh, and he was propped up, in my estimation, by his father's friends. Um, but then in 2016, it switched, and Jeb became the Fredo, yeah. because George was was the president. He was totally insignificant when it came to running the, to the nomination. He was like, uh, but Trump made him insignificant. Yeah. And, he made everybody. And, and, to, and to Trump's credit, he took them all down without a doubt to the to, without the crassest levels. From, 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 from Lion Ted, Mario. He came up with a nickname that helped define every one of them. And he couldn't do that to Biden. He 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 labeled Biden Sleepy Joe, and that Sleepy Joe thing never really took. And of course, the COVID thing didn't help either. But it's it's kind of tough to label Biden as a radical socialist. You know, yeah. here's a guy who's been glad handed his way across the aisle for forty five years. I mean, he comes out of Delaware. One of the things in Delaware was the Great. credit card company. The guy, I mean, he was a big backer of the credit card companies. What were they getting? Twenty eight percent of the borrow money from yep. him. I mean, that's usury. Yeah. No. So I mean, to paint him as a as a, as a socialist is kind of a tough sell, I think. Okay. So today is May twenty sixth, uh, two thousand twenty one. This day in history, I'm going to give you a different this day in history. May twenty fifth, two thousand twenty one. Yesterday. What happened in history of significance yesterday? What year are we talking? Two thousand twenty-one is really yesterday. yesterday what happened? Yes, what yeah, happened by, by the way, yesterday would be two thousand twenty-one. Oh, it was. I'm glad you woke me up. I've only been asleep for a few years in that coma. Uh, I don't know what happened yesterday was so significant. Everything it, 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 that happens in the news. There's, there's a ceasefire in. Uh, with the Israelis and Hamas, I think that's fairly significant. I'll give you a hint. He was a guest on our show. Dumbfounded now, aren't you? Totally. Dumbfounded. Cowboy Joe West set the Major League record. Did he do it yesterday? For the most games umpired in Major League history. And it happened yesterday. And it happened yesterday. Oh, fantastic. I'm so delighted. Congratulations, Joe. I, I feel that that it will mark your five years from today, you'll be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And for our guests out there, I, I recommend going to Umpire. our archives and, and check out the Joe West interview because he was a really entertaining guest and a really nice guy. Terrific guy. His wife, Rita, was there. Uh, there he there is. There he is, and a real character. And He's a, a real, real character. Cowboy Joe West, yeah. our friend, the, the so, major league record holder for most games. He, he, he surpassed Bill Clem's record. Bill Clem set the record in 1951. Wow. So 50, set 70 years later. Congratulations, Joe West. And uh, again, check out that, that interview. That was a really good interview. I enjoyed the hell out of that. He was so down to earth, you know? Yep. Yep. Uh, regular guy. Our guest next week will be Stephen Peterman, executive producer of Murphy Brown, Suddenly Susan, and uh, the Miley Cyrus, Hannah Montana. Hannah Montana. Huh? So he, he worked on three. Big shows, and and Stephen will be an in studio guest. He'll be sitting right oh, where I am. So I'm going to be the real producer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, exactly. Now tell me something. Executive producer. That's the uh, writer. That's the writer. The guy who who writes responsible for the writing of the shows. Well, and and cast the writer. Show. Can't they just call him the writer? You can't call anybody writers anymore. Anybody takes offense at that title. Really? Yeah. And here I was trying to be a writer all my life. Yeah. <laughs>
and uh, get out and vote for Lucy Lang if you live yes, in Manhattan. Yeah, Manhattan, DA, Lucy, Lucy Lang. I think the uh, election is uh, January, J June, June, J U N E 21st or, or thereabouts. If you live in Manhattan, look it up. But Lucy Lang for district attorney, uh, replacing Sally. That, that's for sure. And then if any religious people are out there, any religious people watching our podcast, uh, say a prayer for Frank's junk. <laughs> Say good night, Billy. <laughs> good night, Billy. <laughs> Say good night, Derek. Good night, everybody. Good night, folks. Good Thank night, you. Frank. We'll see you next week.